Okay, Mike, do you have a question or comment for our yeah, guests? Yeah, I had a question basically to the panel um, in general, and that's the issue around accessibility of poetry. I know, um, for me, I'm always fascinated by things I don't understand. So when I read the Wasteland for the first time, I spent hours researching it and reading up on it and understanding all of what it meant. And I was finding with these last two or three weeks of poetry on Mod Po that if I didn't listen to you guys talk, I would read this stuff and get absolutely nothing. I wouldn't even know what to do with it. I wouldn't even know how to make sense of it. My question is, is that something that concerns the panel, that it does often take a lot of work on the part of the listener to make sense of their poetry. Is that one of their goals? Um, it, I think it raises this whole issue of which, who's the audience to whom they're writing for? Is it just people who have a good background in poetry and can make sense of it? Or is it just a guy up the street who just wants to read something that will have some effect on them in some way, emotionally? Mike, that's a great question, and I think the best thing to do would be for you to listen to the answers while you hang up so that we can get someone else on the call, but thank you for calling, Mike, and it's good to talk to you. And thanks, Al, for all the work you do. Great. Thank I'll you. You're most welcome. Um, I want to frame this. Uh, I want to start with Tracy. I, I don't think of any of this work this week. I'm sorry, I'm going to disagree with Mike. 9.1 was language poetry. That takes a lot of work. 9.2 was aleatory and chance operations, quasi unintentional poetry. I think that takes some work if you're trying to make some meaning. I, I think the work, your work, doesn't take a lot of work, I think. So I just want to stipulate that. And after I hear from Tracy, then Kenny, then Mike, I want to go to Anna and Ali for a quick response about the issue of accessibility. Tracy? Yeah. Um, I think that framing is the key. I think people are capable of understanding very complicated things, but not if they're not un invited to understand them. You know, I mean, have a conversation with, I work with a, a lot of musicians, and for a while, one of my band iterations, it must have been my third or something, I was around, uh, I was the only woman in a band. There's a lot of really big guys, jazz musicians, and their sports thing was completely out of control. It was out of control. Was it mostly basketball and football? It was. Uh, I think it was lacrosse. I don't know. It was everything. <laughs> I think it was. Lacrosse. I don't care about sports. It was out of control. I'm not talking about like I like this guy. I like Dr. J, who's on campus. I'm. I'm saying like when he was in high school, but then he tripped on. A, I'm like, what? What are you saying? What are you talking about? Why? How do you know about this child's knee? It's very. <laughs> it's very intricate. And, and and it's very specific. It's like worse than Dungeons and, and Dragons and Arms it's Law. Inaccessible. It's, it's inaccessible. No, it's absolutely accessible because sports is a context in which men and women are invited to be specific, um, nuanced, and complicated. But when people say that about language and literature, the patina of elitism pushes people away. The first time that I started experimenting with sound poetry was at the Apollo Theater which is bad enough. You think amateur night is bad? This was a special show for teenagers at the Apollo. So the, the people were ready to boo just because, you, because they could. And I, and I did an experimental sound poem, and they went crazy. They loved it. And this is all like Harlem kids and, and Brooklyn kids. Um, I don't know who was the rowdiest, but... I, I was experimenting with this stuff, and they were totally into it. And I think it was because I said this, the first thing was this poem called Project Princess that I started messing around with, and I said, this is for the ladies in the house. And then, and people start, which is a hip-hop trope, and <laughs> they felt invited, and as I went pretty far out with the sounds, and they were totally into it. So I think it's, it's, it's a matter of, as you said, I'm going to frame this question. Yeah. I think the border... Yeah. is the elitism that, right. we are with, that we surround ourselves with. I mean, nice. I think there's a reason why Kenny's on, involved with popular television and he's also known in the avant-garde right. community. Think about it. Think about it. Um, all three of you at right. one time were affiliated with an academic institution. institution. You've moved out into what is essentially public service. Kenny has always been willing to accept invitations to go on television, to go to the White House, uh, and, and, and gets flack sometimes from inside the academy and elsewhere. And Tracy, you, you cut your teeth on the spoken word movement, you know, MTV, Unplugged, uh, New York uh, Cafe, uh, just um, like right out there, and academia came later. So you, we, we think the three of you as really, I don't want to say non-academic poets, but really poets who are out there, 
So, Kenny, do you want to speak to this issue, any aspect of it? Sure. Um, <clears throat> how could... Uh, it was was it was it Mike Mike uh, Koski yes how in the world could Mike not understand anything I've written I mean it's very clear uh, it, you know this is what a guy s every word a guy spoke uh, for a week or retyping a newspaper if you read the newspaper you can understand the book transcriptions of of historic radio reports all in somewhat normal English so. Uh, what Mike probably really doesn't understand is why, and that's the real question. You know, we, the text why is do radically it? simple. There's a radical simplicity to the ideas. There's a radical dumbness to what I do, which makes you think like, but why would he do that? And that's where the conversation about this work begins. It's really not about the text. The text is deflective and reflective, so that it throws it back on you to, well, why would that guy retype? Spend a year and a half retyping the New York Times. A year time. and a half. So also, so this kind of work, um, you know, and I think Florf and I, I was, was, we were involved in radical populism. There wasn't, there's nothing about this work that you can't understand. Mm -hmm. um, so, so actually, people say that this is elitist, but when I read at the White House, I read Whitman and I read Crane, and then I read traffic reports. They snooze through the Whitman and the Crane, the real poetry. But when I read traffic reports, the, the room full of senators and the president <laughs> lit up. You know, and the, so the most radically avant-garde move, the move where you read something you didn't write and claimed it as poetry, was the one that they actually understood. So this is where the radical sort of ideas of populism come in. Thank you, Kenny. That was amazing. Okay. Mike, your thoughts on this? Oh. Sorry, go ahead, Tracy. You no, go ahead. You had a thought. Well, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, like, I think Mike um, from New York does have a really good point, though, and that is, where does that border come from? Like, if you're saying that the poems and the poetry itself is not elitist, that it's radically simple, then where? I mean, but it's true that people don't feel totally connected, and I'm interested in in a. In, a, in poetry and you know complicate however you want to describe the poetry having the same sort of lack of elitism the lack of borderness elite borderness that say people who used to sing Italians who used to sing Italian opera when it was a popular art form like how do we create a context in which poetry feels like that for people mm. well put my goodness you guys are inspiring me um, I, uh, Mike McGee you know, I, I like Tracy's phrase uh, the patina of elitism um, because I, I do think this is more about um, the kind of uh, way in which we frame reception of the work than it is about the work itself and and you know if, if you think about just everyday talk vernacular speech um, it, it's extraordinarily complex mm -hmm. and and people use it in very very complex ways and understand it in complex ways it's no less complex than any poem you might care to name um, and so uh, I think um, when people um, approach a language poem or a poem by you know pound or William Carlos Williams or whoever you might want to name they're gonna be, Depending on how they feel about their um, um, their the permission they have to engage that poem, um, you know that's actually what's going to govern um, how they feel about it and whether they feel like it's complex or simple. And uh, you know, in, in my writing, especially in the early days of writing with the Florif Group, I mean, I was always very interested in writers who were um, you know, kind of playing around with notions of high and low, mm -hmm. and and incorporating what would be considered high speech and low speech, and at that time in two thousand two, three, four, um, you know, I I just remember be, uh, it becoming very very uh, uh, clear to me that uh, the internet was doing all of this in a much more radical and interesting way that all of a sudden all the high and low was just blended there for you. Mm. Um, and that's the essence of, for instance, my Angie Dickinson. You're, you're actually being modest when you say I was interested in how people were doing the high and low. I mean, that's exactly what that book is. 
That's right. And, and but I think that what was um, what enabled that was you could go to the internet and very 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 rapidly assimilate um, a lot of different kinds of high mm -hmm. and low language. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and then the other thing I would say about this related to what Tracy was saying is. I, I think the the performance aspect of a lot of the Florf poets is also quite important in terms mm. of organizing the reception of that work. And, and one of the things that that I think we were interested in, and I was certainly interested in, was the similarity in a way between the way that someone like Sharon Mesmer, for instance, was performing her poetry and stand-up comedy, which everyone kind of gets, or everyone in quotes. Um, but if you think of stand-up comedians like Sarah Silverman or Louis C.K. or people like that, and then you watch Sharon Mesmer performances, to me, there's a particularly in the way in which it uh, people are being invited to like that work. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of similarity there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 